everybody. So glad to be back in Tokyo and back at ACCJ Direct Marketing Committee. Thank you, Joe, for inviting me back. I'm so pleased. I think many of you know that I once lived in Japan. I spent my 20s here, um, of course, teaching English uh, in a beautiful city called Kanazawa. And I lived there for six years. And then I came to Tokyo and lived here for two years. So um, it's just a great joy for me to be back in Japan. Thank you. But the subject of my talk today is um, getting value from data. <clears throat> and I, I do have a little uh, confession to make. When I was in business school at, at Columbia, I took a, a required course in statistics. Have any of you ever studied statistics? Can I see a show of hands? Whoa, this is good. This is good. Well, my confession, and of course, you, these two guys are uh, analysts, so um, I'm sure you're way ahead of the rest of us in, in that arena. But my confession is that I actually got a C in statistics. It was the only C I got at Columbia Business School, and I was really ashamed of that. But then, when I finished Columbia, I actually went into data-driven marketing and realized that applied statistics is extremely interesting and useful. And I became a, a huge enthusiast and um, appreciator of statistical methods. So um, that's what allowed me to you know, sort of get into the world of data as a marketer and, and find real value. Um, I turned into a B2B marketer about 20 years ago when I um, moved from Time Warner to Ziff Davis, a computer industry publishing company, and then went to IBM. And I learned that in the B2B world, data is pretty, treated pretty differently from consumer data. And I um, found it so fascinating, I decided to, to study it a, a little bit. But I also learned that there are many marketers in the world of B2B who really find data unpleasant or you know, not a subject that makes them excited. In fact, I have a funny cartoon here to share with you uh, about the five stages of data-driven marketing and how we go from denial to anger to bargaining. And um, there are a lot of people in both consumer and B2B marketing who I think really wish they didn't have to worry about data. In fact, I think what they hope is the data fairy will come by and wave her wand, and they can just forget about data and let it be somebody else's problem. But in fact, data is so important in business to business. And I've got here, uh, I hope, a convincing argument for why, um, especially in business to business where every account is so valuable. Compared to a consumer household, a business customer may, may be worth 10 or 100 times the value of a consumer customer relationship. So if we are under leveraging our relationship with with uh, customers and prospects in B2B. We may be addressing them incorrectly if we don't have the right information. We may be missing prospective customers. And worst of all, um, we may be throwing away money on um, marketing communications and marketing actions that are not reaching the target audience. In fact, I found uh, some numbers that suggested that literally billions of dollars uh, are being wasted in the US. Now, this is consumer and B2B as a result of bad data. 
So I hope you're all convinced of the importance of data, and that's why I decided to write this book. Because um, I know that lots of business marketers are um, sub-optimizing their marketing because they don't have accurate and complete data on the one hand, and or they haven't figured out how best to apply data to their marketing activities. I was lucky enough to find a co-author, Theresa Kushner, who was a colleague of mine at IBM. Uh, while I'm a marketing professional, Theresa is actually a data administration professional. So she and I made a really good team. I wrote half of the chapters. She wrote half of the chapters. And we ended up with a, a book that covers, I think, if you look at the table of contents here, you'll see that it, it covers a pretty wide um, set of topics. And if you uh, would like to check it out, you can download the first two chapters um, in a PDF format from the website that we built to support the book. It's called naturally b2bdatadrivenmarketing.com. So please go ahead and, and, and have, a look, have a look there. But of all of the subjects that we could talk about relating to using data in business marketing, I decided to focus on just a few today because of time and also I didn't want to put you all to sleep. So I'm going to cover three topics today. The, the first is I'm going to talk about where B2B data comes from and some of the excited exciting new sources of data that are available for uh, business to business prospecting today, at least in North America. I can't guarantee that all of these sources are available in Asia. Um, then I'm going to talk about the delightful subject of keeping your data clean and fresh. This is another subject that people wish would go away, but we have to face it. And then third, I'm going to share a couple of case studies of how business marketers have used data successfully. And I hope you'll find those stories interesting. So let's begin um, on the subject of data sourcing. I'm making the case here that all of us need to have a, a, a repository of information about our customers and prospects. This is known as a database. And of course, these days, the da databases are electronic uh, resources, some in the cloud, some um, on, your, on your servers. But there are so many sources of data internally and externally, I have here a checklist of the sources that I think if you haven't used, if there are any of these that you haven't used, you can um, have a look because most companies build their marketing databases beginning with internal information like sales records, operating uh, and fulfillment and billing system records, data from their websites and so forth. And then they su supplement it with external sources of data, most of which I've listed on the right, and ultimately uh, end up with, I hope, a sortable and accessible resource for which, uh, from, from which they can research, analyze, segment, and contact their customers and prospects. So to that end, where I want to go next is um, thinking about data acquisition strategically. Um, the reason I focus on this is that most of us marketers, and I'm sure this is true of everybody in the room, Marketers tend to be a very curious lot, and if the information is available, we sort of want it. And our strategy is often, well, let's go get it and we'll figure out later how to put it to use. And I would argue it's, you know, uh, you know how a carpenter says you measure twice and cut once? I would say for us B2B marketers, it's important to build a plan for data acquisition first and acquire the data second. 
So with this, I'm, I'd like to introduce a four-step process for making sure you have the data that you need in your marketing database to get your business uh, uh, supported. The first step is to build a data strategy. And really, that's just a fancy term for figuring out what data you need and why you need it, meaning you don't want to buy anything or acquire anything that you don't have a business that it, that you don't have a business justification for. The second is to enhance the data that you ha have built internally or acquire in, acquired internally using appended data from third parties. And the reason I suggest this, um, third parties could be like Dun and Bradstreet, for example, or other sellers of data who have information that you might be able to um, ga gain access to commercially. Appended data uh, allows you to just pull in one field or another to fill in the gaps of the customer or prospect record that you have on hand. Um, Mr. Niwayama, could I ask you, are there other sources of third-party data than Dun & Bradstreet in Japan? Okay, Tehoku, da Tehoku Data Bank and Toho, what was that? Tokyo Shoho Research would also be a source of appended data, thank you. Um, then the third step is data discovery, or this is a, just a term that means figuring out what data elements are still missing in your database and going out by hand and grabbing those up. Now, these days with uh, the availability of LinkedIn and other internet research tools, we can do a lot of this by hand ourselves. Hire a college intern to help you. Um, but essentially it means doing the work through hand research because frankly, the way data changes in B2B, um, what you can buy from the third party vendors often needs to be updated and enhanced. So that's the third method. And then the fourth step is to make sure that you're focused on your top accounts first because building out a complete record of customers and prospects it costs money. And not only acquiring that data but also maintaining it um, in, incurs expense uh, as well as time. So I suggest you focus on your top accounts first. So does this make sense? Have I put you guys to sleep yet? I know it's a, a little bit dry. Okay, so then um, let's get to the more exciting stuff here. And um, uh, Charles, I think you'll be pleased to see one of your products listed here, coincidentally. Um, I, I wanted to share with you some of the exciting new sources of prospecting data that are available, at least in North America, thanks to um, the, really, it's the internet that uh, creative use of the internet that has allowed us to gain access to uh, prospecting data thr through um, um, in, uh, some of the creative ways that the internet is being put to use. The first one is a, a company called data.com. It's a subsidiary of Salesforce. And it was built when, um, uh, by a company called Jigsaw about I think about eight years ago, when somebody came up with the brilliant idea of enabling salespeople to swap prospects business cards. Now, some people find this sort of a, a, a questionable from a privacy perspective, but fortunately, in the B2B world, consumer privacy is um, not uh, treated the, the same way as in consumer uh, data-driven marketing. But um, the advantage to a salesperson who is maybe very deeply connected in one account, who wants to go target another account and be able to gain new contacts into the other account in exchange was immediate and uh, within a matter of 
12 or 18 months, Jigsaw managed to build a marketing database of over 16 million business contacts and make that available to marketers like us for prospecting purposes. Um, it was such a hit, so successful that they were sold for nearly $200 million to, um, and I'm sorry, to point to you, Charles, but uh, to, to Salesforce and are made available to Salesforce subscribers, I think, as, a, as an upsell, right, for, for a fee. Now, the second one I wanted to tell you about is called Zoom Info, which was another early experiment in data sourcing using the internet. This is data that's scraped from corporate websites. You know how almost every company will have a listing of its senior management on their website? That information is scraped and deduplicated and made available for marketing purposes thanks to Zoom Info. A more recent um, entrant into this market is Leadspace, which is an Israeli company made up of former Israeli army engineers, I'm told. And their, their claim to fame is that they will build a statistical model of your top customers and send you lookalikes that they are pulling from the general business population. So it's a, a terrific um, opportunity for finding prospects who are statistically very similar to your top accounts. The third one, Sixth Sense, just burst on the scene about 12 months ago. And their claim to fame is they, uh, they, they tell us that they can give us intent data. Are you guys familiar with that term? It's, uh, the idea is that business buyers these days tend to be doing a lot of research online before they figure out how to solve their whatever business problem they have. And as part of that research, they're downloading white papers, they're spending time on informative websites, and otherwise S signaling that they are interested in a particular category or a particular subject. And it's that, those behaviors that Sixth Sense will grab up, particularly this is designed for tech marketers, and they will then um, alert you that a certain individual is researching in your category and you can use that name as a, as a prospect. And then the last one I wanted to tell you about is called Social123. This is also very new, and how they differentiate themselves is by compiling very rich profiles of business buyers uh, thanks to the social media activity those buyers are performing. So naturally, the core of this profile is going to be the LinkedIn profile of that individual, but it's also supplemented by their behavior on Twitter and Facebook and Google Plus and wherever else. And this allows us to gain a lot of, a lot of insight into, into people who, who might be valuable prospects for us. So are any Japanese providers um, developing similar sources of prospecting data for Japanese marketers? might be a business opportunity for some of you. Just a thought. So with that, um, I also wanted to mention that when thinking about how you're going to source data for your database, possibly the most underutilized opportunity is your own website, which if you add a, uh, a piece of attractive content, and a dedicated landing page with a web form, you can actually convert your B2B website into an inquiry generator or a prospecting resource on your own. Um, I think this is an essential part of B2B marketing today. I have an example from RSA Security, which is owned by um, EMC. Um, they are offering, as you can see in the, um, this box here on their homepage, they're saying, 
uh, you can learn how Fortune 1000 security executives, what they're saying about the, uh, about the security problems that they're facing. If I'm researching in, in data security, I'm going to want to read that. So you click through on this red box, and you're taken to this form, which you fill out, get the downloaded um, document, and that data then becomes part of the prospect universe of RSA for their marketing purposes. So if you were not using a web form gated by, um, as a, a gated front end to a piece of very attractive content, you're missing an opportunity to uh, de-anonymize your web uh, visitors and, um, and turn them into prospects that you can actually take marketing actions toward. Now, only two or three percent of visitors to your website are going to be persuaded to fill out this form. I mean, that's a reasonable estimation, wouldn't you say? I mean, that's an old direct marketing right. number. And in fact, um, the, the research suggests that that's, that's true. But there is another secret weapon in the B2B marketing toolkit, namely the IP address of the visitor. Now, if someone is researching at your website, hasn't filled out the form, you can still get a sense of who they are based on the IP address of their browser. And uh, you can do that by hand using Google Analytics, or you can hire one of these, there are several providers, of alert services. One of the earliest ones was Visitor Track, which um, I, I show here. Visitor Track places a small amount of code on your, your homepage. And then uh, as, a, um, uh, as visitors come, they will send you an alert that says, someone from General Electric visited your page five minutes ago. Here's how many minutes they were on which page. Here's the URL they came from. Here's where they went to when they left. And here are the publicly available names, titles, and email addresses of some of the senior executives at that company. Oh, this is a tremendous resource for a B2B marketer, right? Let me ask you, if you had an alert such as that, what would you do with it? Any ideas? Here you have an opportunity. You know that someone has visited from a, an important account. You don't know their name because you know, all you know is that they came from a certain company. Is there any marketing action that you might take as a result? What would you do, Mr. Kawai? Uh, I'm sorry? Ah, very interesting. So you're saying you might give the name to a sales rep? Is yes. Um, I'm watching and listening to your presentation. It's, you are talking about B2B marketing, B2B marketing. Yes. But these data, at the end of the day, move to SFA and assign by, 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 by company by company to sales, I think. Absolutely. That's exactly what I would do. In, in a case like this, we don't know the actual name of the, of the person who's visited you that morning from that company. So we, we can't send him an email. <laughs> we can't phone him. But if we have a salesperson who's already in charge of that account, we would certainly want to alert the salesperson that someone from that account has been poking around the website this morning. Or we may ask the salesperson to call into the account. We wouldn't ask him to say, hey, I noticed somebody was poking around you know, my, my site this morning. It might be a little creepy. But certainly, the interest in our product that's being demonstrated from that account is something that we would want to take, uh, take marketing action on. 
Absolutely, thank you. So with that, um, I'm just gonna jump over this one. I wanna get to the subject of data hygiene. <laughs> Isn't that a funny term, data hygiene? Um, the issue here is that B2B data tends to degrade uh, at the rate of four to six percent per month. So to illustrate that, may I ask of all of you in the room, how many of you have had a change on your business cards in the last 12 months? Any of you had? You either changed jobs, you changed titles, you changed phone numbers, you changed mail stops. Typically it's around 30% of a B2B audience who are having some kind of change. We're always changing. Either we're changing companies or we're changing job descriptions. And um, in consumer, at least in the US, Americans tend to move a lot. But in B2B, it's worse. It's about a third of your file will have errors in it after 12 months. So this means we have to be vigilant. In fact, I've got some data here from Dun and Bradstreet that says in every two hours in the US, this kind of velocity of change takes place. So you're seeing here 700 business addresses move in the US in every two hours. I mean, how are we gonna keep up with this kind of change? So what we have to do is be vigilant about keeping our data fresh and clean. And this is not easy. But I do have five tips for how to get on top of it and be proactive. The first one is to enter the data correctly in the first place. Now, in your company, who's in charge of entering data into your CRM system or your database or somewhere in your in your office? Salespeople. Salespeople. How many people have data entered by salespeople? How many companies? Uh, does anybody use another person to key enter data when it, what if you attend a trade show and then you come back and you have all these cards from people you met? How is that data key entered? So, <laughs> so you're using a physical file. Well, that's a database. Very, very interesting. Well, in most companies, the person who's entering the data tends to be either a salesperson, who's, by the way, not necessarily trained and motivated to enter data. In fact, I would argue that salespeople should be selling rather than doing administrative tasks, or the data is entered by a fairly junior administrative person who, at least in North America, tends to be sort of at the bottom of the prestige ladder and uh, certainly isn't paid well or given a lot of respect. So um, if we want our data to be entered correctly in the first place, we should be thinking about how to motivate and train those people. Now the same thing goes for anyone who has a customer facing role in your firm. So this is your call center, your face to face reps, your inside sales reps, your customer service reps, anyone who has a chance to say, by the way, is this still your email address? Or if you ever hear of a change in a prospect or customer's data to bring that to the attention of your company. The third technique is to use uh, address standardization software, which generally is about direct mail and phone, the corporate level phone. It's not going to include information about titles or job functions, unfortunately, or email addresses, but at least it'll help partially. Another new technique is to develop an online customer preference center where you invite your customers to tell you when their data changes. Um, this can be in the guise, of course, of giving them the opportunity to tell you how often they want to hear from you by email or other 
other means, but you can also collect uh, information about their new, um, their new changes. And then finally, for your top accounts anyway, it's a good idea to do outreach, whether by phone, by email, or um, other methods, to, especially to your top customers, to ask them to verify their names, their titles, and uh, that is really the number one way for keeping your data fresh. There's a cost to that, but it's highly important when each account is worth a lot to you and you don't want to miss out on, on opportunity. I'll just give you an example of that. Uh, a mail order company called um, Mrs. Beasley's sells about 60% of its pound cakes into corporations who use them as holiday gifts. These accounts tend to be much larger uh, in value than the consumer accounts that they have. So every August, they verify the, the person who's in charge of holiday buying with an outbound email and phone call to double check that they're sending their catalog to the right person. So this is just a, a great idea for uh, keeping on top of your, your data quality uh, of your top accounts. See what I mean? Now, let's get to the case studies and, and then we'll wrap up. The first case that I wanted to share with you is about um, a machine tools manufacturer from Japan called Makino. Are any of you familiar with Makino? It's, uh, I think, a, a, a leading uh, manufacturer of machine tools. You, you know them? Well, they have a very large US division. Um, of course, in the US, they call themselves Makino which is sort of funny. Now, in the US, Makino is also a market leader, and <clears throat> this is their, their homepage. What they decided was about, in, in about 2002, um, their go-to-market strategy in those days was based on typical industrial marketing. Number one, they exhibited at trade shows. Number two, they advertised in trade publications. This is how industrial marketers would promote themselves in those days. But they saw that things were changing. With the arrival of the internet, buying behavior was changing, and they realized that they needed to change the way they go to market. So they decided that they needed to be much better targeted. The strategy that they came up with was to build a database. They knew that there were 55,000 accounts in North America who buy machine tools. But at the same time, Makino being a premier provider, they're the highest priced and the best quality machine tools uh, manufacturer in North America, that there were only, there were fewer than 20,000 that they actually really wanted to do business with, who would ever really buy from them. So they said, instead of blanketing the market by exhibiting at all these trade shows and, and uh, publishing, or, or pr uh, buying advertising in all of these trade pubs, we need to get focused on the accounts that have the highest potential for us. So they built a database using sales logics. The first thing they did was, of course, import internal information from their billing systems. And they also discussed with their salespeople what accounts do you want to be doing business with? They also cut a deal with a trade publisher to identify the top buyers of machine tools in the industry. And they brought all those accounts, deduplicated them into sales logics, and ended up with about 15,000 targets that they wanted to focus all their marketing efforts on. Oh, by the way, they also asked their salespeople 
What are the marquee accounts that you'd love to be doing business with? What are the customers that maybe they'll never really buy from us, but we would love to be able to have them in our, in our family of customers? These would be companies like Caterpillar and General Electric. So they added companies, companies like that. So with that uh, resource, of a database of all of the accounts that they wanted to do business with and continue to do business with, they were able to invest all of their marketing efforts on a particular list of accounts and reduce the amount of waste dramatically. So um, they then undertook an, a, an effort in the area of content marketing. Are you all familiar with the term? content marketing, which means developing educational content, whether it's webinars, white papers, research reports, books, videos, whatever, informational resources to let your customers and prospects learn from you, to establish yourself as a trusted authority and expert in your field, and also increase your search engine rankings because this educational content posted online will m help you be found by search engines. So the first thing they did was they started a very active webinar program. Every month they created three webinars to the point where they ended up with an archive of 150 highly technical and strategically considered webinars that have become, frankly, in the, in the years since then, these 150 webinars have become the go-to educational resource for engineers who are trying to become expert in the metal cutting business. So they established themselves as the training camp for all the young engineers and were able to turn around and use these webinars, um, spec sheets, white papers, and so forth as a tool for reaching their audience through Facebook. Now, I don't know about Facebook Japan, but in the US, until just the last couple of years, Facebook was not really considered an opportune environment for industrial marketers. It was really more for cat videos and, you know, children bragging about their nights out. But Makino saw the light early and built a Facebook page populated by this very informative and educational content, namely the webinars and the, and the white papers and, and research reports, to the point where they now have 74,000 followers. What the, the head of Machino America told me that he, it's his belief that everybody in the machine tools industry is among those 74,000 and uh, that they view Machino as a resource for how to keep up with the industry. Uh, remember I said there were only 55,000 buyers or buying accounts of machine tools in, in North America? Well, 74,000 people are following you know, on Facebook. Question? So, sorry, Ruth, when you sure. mentioned those webinars before, mm. I presume they were free webinars. They didn't try to charge for those webinars. Yes, that's exactly right. Thank you for clarifying that. They were free to the extent that there was not a cost associated, but you do have to fill out a form and give up your contact information in exchange. So they are gated webinars, and that helps build the database that we just discussed earlier. So um, the, uh, the VP of marketing at uh, Makino Americas told me that they're generating six or seven qualified leads a day from their Facebook page, thanks to the rich content that they've developed over the last 10 years that um, has established them as a thought leader and trusted resource 
in the machine tools industry. Frankly, this is the way people are going to market in North America these days. Content combined with data and, uh, and, and uh, based on the strategy of inbound marketing. Now, the, um, in terms of the results, Mark Rentschler, the VP of marketing at, at Makino America, tells me that not only is there social media and you know, traffic huge, they're actually vastly increasing the number of RFQs. Or we keep in mind, these machine tools cost anywhere from 100 to uh, 100,000 to a quarter of a million dollars. So you know, this is serious. these are serious purchases. They've had record sales four years in a row. And best of all, marketing as a, a, um, uh, a, uh, as a percentage of sales has shown a downward turn year after year with a little bit of an uptick in 2002. But the trend is uh, highly productive for, uh, for shareholders and, and senior management. So I consider this a, a great success in terms of B2B marketing using, using data combined with content. Now I have one other example, which is a technology company. It's software as a service, Austin, Texas based, and they provide call center software to medium to large enterprises. Um, not very large enterprises, but um, it's uh, call center software for companies that are um, interested in letting the, uh, the software be provided as a service by a third party. Now, this company um, decided that they wanted to stop wasting marketing dollars on prospects who were never going to buy. They have been in business for 10 years, so they had a pretty active customer base that they were able to send to lead space um, and um, have them be modeled. So the VP of demand gen there said, what, uh, what we want to do is find prospects who look like our existing best customers. That's what that initial quote says. So instead of blanketing the market with um, mes marketing messages, they said, let's identify the six or 7,000 accounts who are most likely to become good quality customers for us. So now LeadSpace, uh, that I, LeadSpace is the Israeli company I mentioned a few minutes ago. They sent a, 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 a small file of their top accounts to LeadSpace for modeling. LeadSpace then provided six or seven prospects back. And this is the list of attributes that the statistical model resulted in. I thought you would find this interesting because one of the great things, remember I said that I got a C in statistics, but one of the things that I appreciate is that data analysis can give us insights into uh, a, a marketing opportunity that we might never have gotten by just our own um, analysis without data. In this case, the variables that turned out to be predictive of a good quality prospect for, uh, for Five9, this company, are listed here. So no surprise, the number of employees in the call center we're going to assume that that's going to be predictive because, you know, if there are too few, then it's going to be too small an account. If there are too many, they probably need a different software solution. Um, but the, uh, the question of whether they use an outbound collections department internally turns out to be predictive of their need for a software solution in their call center. I would never have thought of that. Would you? I mean, that's the kind of data point that is so fascinating, but you might never have thought, understood that through your own analysis. So these are the, the, the variables in case, in case you're interested. So what Five9 has decided to do with those six or 7,000 um, prospective accounts as they come in 
is they sort the new leads and hand them based on the score of how likely they are to buy or how close their uh, score is to their top accounts. They hand the best leads to their in-house sales team. The second tier of leads is given to their phone-based sales uh, or business development team. And the third is given to a third party for either appointment setting over the phone or for some kind of outbound communication to nurture that lead a, a bit before, um, more, before more expensive marketing action is taken. So uh, Doug Seacrest says that this data-driven uh, approach to prospecting has totally revolutionized the way they go to market and re not only reduced waste, but also vastly increased their conversion rates. So my friends, with that, I've, uh, I hope I've persuaded you about the importance of data in B2B marketing today, uh, explained a bit about where to get data and how to keep it clean, and shown you a couple of examples of how businesses are getting value from data today. And so with that, I'm happy to entertain some questions, and certainly I'd like to give away, give away this copy of my book. So um, thank you so much for listening. Thank you. thank you, Ruth. And now we have time for a few questions. Anybody like to volunteer to go first? Eric. Eric, thank you. And we have a microphone, the microphone that'll circulate for you. Eric Wiedemeyer from Taxis Associates. Uh, you showed the uh, the Machino uh, Facebook operation. Yes. Uh, Shall I put it put the slide back? If you like, yeah. Oh, all right. Is uh, is Facebook moved on. is Facebook obviously better than LinkedIn uh, for that sort of application these days in the states? I was a little bit surprised to see that they they use Facebook. I know. Facebook and not LinkedIn. I was surprised too. Now, if you remember from that slide, they are also active on LinkedIn. Sure. But uh, the, the, the features that Facebook offers compared to the functionality at LinkedIn is it's a much more engaging environment. Um, they, the, what, how, how, how many of you are on both Facebook and LinkedIn as individual, in, individual people? You, you know that it has a very different kind of environment and style. Um, on LinkedIn, they have nowhere near the number of uh, followers. They, I think it was closer to 6,000 versus um, 70,000. Uh, and the, the reason is that the presentation of that content on Facebook, it has almost become a kind of community there. Now, they do have a LinkedIn group that they're active in, but for some reason, it just hasn't generated the kind of passionate devotion that the Facebook page has. And I, I agree with you, Eric. I'm really surprised because I think of LinkedIn as the more professional environment. But these days, Facebook has made it possible for um, marketers to create communities that uh, seem to really be gaining traction, even in you know, dry industrial categories like this one. Yeah, you said it. Any other questions, other questions? or comments? Please. Thank you. you uh, Greg Story from Dale Carnegie Training Japan. You mentioned about content marketing before, and you, you gave uh, a couple of examples there. Uh, just thinking about any other examples you've seen uh, where they've been able to use content marketing very effectively to build a community or to build a following, and how they've linked that with other mechanisms, like you mentioned, uh, webinars or teaming it up with something else so that it actually becomes uh, a sort of an ecosystem in its own right. Yeah. Yeah, content marketing is really uh, being acknowledged today as possibly, you could argue, the single most important strategy in B2B marketing. Uh, and the reason is that, uh, as I said earlier, most business buyers are researching online to get educated about problems and solutions that they might be facing in their, their jobs. They are not calling salespeople in the way they used to 15 or 20 years ago. They're doing that research online 
this means that the first 60% or so of their buying process is being conducted without our knowledge. So we as marketers need to jump in early in that process, try to identify who's researching in our category, and feed that research by providing informative content so that they'll think of us as an authoritative, knowledgeable, trusted partner to help them solve the problem you know, when, when they're getting ready to develop a short list of potential vendors. Um, so, you know, content marketing um, is proven, I mean, 86% of B2B marketers today say that they are using content as part of their marketing strategy. Now, where content marketing is going, which is so interesting to me, in B2B is away from the dry as ditch water world of research reports and white papers and uh, very boring, um, you know, uh, deeply, you know, informative pieces, more toward lighter, um, uh, lighter documents like 10 tips documents or ebooks, highly graphically uh, designed ebooks, and most important to my mind, video. Video is huge in B2B today. Why? Because business buyers are still people. And for them, any um, consumption of information that can be, that can involve music or voice and motion is just inherently more appealing than something that needs to be read, especially among millennials who, by the way, well, you know, we used to think of millennials as teenagers. Well, they're actually business buyers now. They're growing up and we need to be able to uh, talk to them in the way that they find, um, you know, accessible. So content marketing uh, is, is becoming lighter, but the principle is still the same. Make sure that we get a hold of them early in their buying process, and I would argue that we figure out a way to persuade them to give us their contact information in exchange for valuable content so that we can add that to our database and kick off an addressable marketing relationship with them. Thanks for asking. Any other comments or questions? Please, Niwayama-san. Are we still okay on time? Thank you for a great presentation. And uh, my question is, uh, what is the uh, definition of R of uh, ROI? Because uh, the lead time of B2B marketing is very long in Japan. Mm. So everybody confused when I uh, explain about ROI. So what is definition of R? <laughs> Return, right? Yeah. Well. Before you set me up with that question, Neo Amazon, <laughs> let me ask you how you describe the meaning of R to your clients. Maybe revenue? Revenue. No. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, you know, of course, ROI is really a financial term. And the way the, any finance people in the room? I mean, those of us who, you know, either have studied finance or worked in finance, we know that it means return on investment, and the definition is that the numerator, it's always expressed in a percent, right? And the numerator is the, uh, inve the, um, the result minus the investment divided by the investment, right? The denominator is the investment. So the big question that you're asking is, should the, the numerator, what items should be included in the numerator, right? And if you're selling over a 24-month period and you, the revenue that you get from a closed sale is not going to be recognizable for 24 months, but we're making these marketing investments now, how do we close the loop on that? It, this is the issue, right? 
Um, so what most B2B marketers do is, is they measure two things. One, they measure the financial, uh, the way the, the finance people want, meaning a classic revenue minus expense divided by, uh, by uh, expense or investment. And then they use interim metrics, which might be as mundane as the number of downloads you had of your white paper or views that you had of your webinar. It might be the number of new names you collected in an account. Um, it might be other measures that suggest you are making progress toward that eventual revenue. But uh, what, what I say is that if your sales management is um, supported properly by a system that allows you to see a lead as it works its way toward, uh, toward closure, that you ought to be able to project based on historical conversion rates, the value of a lead at an early stage, and, um, and take an estimate of the ROI uh, today based on historical projections of whether, um, wh what value that, what revenue value that that lead is gonna be able to produce 24, 24 months ahead. So, so you're really talking about qualified leads to deliver to sales? I'm talking about qualified leads delivered to sales. This is what B2B marketers are all about. Our job as marketers in B2B, with the exception of like corporate communications, most of us who are on the ground marketers, it's our job to enhance sales productivity and provide leverage to the, to the sales function. Okay, actually I see a couple of hands, but yeah, yeah, please. Thank you very much, Ruth. Very interesting to me, as I told you, this is uh, rather new for me, but I worked in marketing and sales and business in Japan a long time. Mm. And the first thing that hits me is that for most Japanese companies I know, this is far out of what they are doing today. So my question is, besides your book that I want to buy, because I don't think I would win it, but no. do you have anything written in Japanese? Because if I'm going to convince some of the people I work with on the Japanese side that we could do something like Makino is doing, that mm. would be great if it's oh in Japanese. Oh my god. So I'm glad that you made that comment on tape in public, because one of the things that I'm working on this week is to see whether I can arrange for a Japanese edition of this book to be developed. So stay tuned. Okay, last question, Leon. Yes, my name is Leon van Aulinga with Dabin Organic Japan. Um, one question, I just entered this company earlier this year, uh, B2B is new to me. Uh -huh. Do you believe this is applicable to, to uh, every part of B&B? And the reason I'm asking is because I have a uh, colleague CEO down in Australia, mm. and he, f he avoids like any kinds of internet um, because he doesn't want to be copied or, or whatever, and he's very successful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'd like to know more about um, this person and, and his activities. Um, it is true that in business to business, traditionally, there's been a, an attitude of secrecy um, as a marketer, I've been frustrated over the years because it's generally difficult to get testimonials in the B2B world because, you know, I might go to a, a, a customer and say, would you mind, you love our product, it's really working well for you, would you mind letting us um, get a, a, a quote from you? And they say, oh no, oh no, we don't want our competitors to know about this wonderful solution that we found from you and uh, that this is uh, very typical. But at the same time, business buyers are online today. This is where they get information about problems and solutions. So if you are not participating in digital marketing and avoiding the internet, you're missing business opportunity. Now, there are probably exceptions. Um, certain niches that, that may be true. 
so let's speak after and you can tell me more. But generally, um, digital and uh, internet marketing is uh, one of the important elements of the B2B marketing toolkit. And I should mention that that doesn't mean that we can go entirely digital because face-to-face -face marketing is still incredibly important. There's abundant data that says that, and this is why, um, why Salesforce has 60,000 attendees at its Dreamforce event. Um, it's, uh, pe people want to do business with people that they know and like and trust. And, you know, nobody's going to make a purchase, especially a quarter of a million dollar purchase, if they haven't looked the person in the eye. So um, it, it's not all digital, but that uh, is a, a channel and, a, and an environment that is extremely important today. Okay, so, so Joe, we, are we ready? Thank you. We'll have you draw.